So, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Why is that relevant? I don't know. You brought it up. Well, okay, so let's talk about it. Why is that important? First of all, it's theologically correct. And if you're an atheist, listen to this. Assume for argument's sake that I'm telling you the truth and I'm talking a God, about a God that actually exists. Well, that's a big assumption. Yeah, well, just for argument's sake, just so we can have a conversation that's theological in nature. You understand the difference? This isn't me proving God exists to you. It's not an Anselm's argument for God or a proof of God's existence. It's a theological conversation. So if you are to enter into it, you assume for argument's sake that we are talking about a God who actually exists. So we can discuss the theology. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Why is that relevant? Well, a bunch of different reasons. First and foremost... Jesus is 100% man. Like I say, assume, if you're an atheist for argument's sake, that God is real and Jesus is really God. Why would God make him 100% man? What's the point? What's the purpose? If Jesus is 100% man, first of all, that is God manifesting himself in human form. That's an important concept right there. God has manifested himself in human form so that you, the human being, see how, how God actually lives and breathes and acts in the world. That's point number one. Point number two, he's 100% man, which means you can identify with him completely. He's, in a lot of ways, just like you. Eats, sleeps, drinks... Goes, you know, probably slept four hours a night. I don't know how long Jesus slept. Probably slept four to eight hours a night. And he can be tempted in all ways just like you. So, when you're reading the trial in the wilderness, it was suspenseful. No, you weren't in suspense? Yeah, it was suspenseful. You weren't in All right, well, it was potentially suspenseful because he could have sinned and disrupted the whole project. Satan comes up and says, turn this bread into, turn these stones into bread. And he's like, thank God, I'm freaking starving. Boom, <laughs> they're bread. Oh, wait, dang, blew the, whole, blew the whole thing. Right there, blown the whole deal. So he was tempted in all ways, just like you. And he overcame sin in the flesh so that he could become a sin offering for all mankind. Now, the important part, one of the important parts of him being 100% man is to show you how to live in this body. We are to be as Jesus was in the world. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What does that actually mean? That means if you look at how Jesus actually lived, the most important part was he was constantly connected to the Father in prayer. Never did anything of his own accord, never did anything of his own will, said continuously, not my will, but thine be done. So he's constantly trying to access the Father's will and trying to speak only the Father's words. And ultimately, true Christianity is thinking only the thoughts that God puts in your mind. Yeah, it's actually in the Bible. Take every thought captive in obedience to Jesus. Take every single thought captive in obedience to Jesus. So a true prayerfully a true Christian remember that true Scotsman fallacy a true Christian does what does what one prays without ceasing the Bible says pray without ceasing tries to speak only the words that God put in their mouth two three Constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus didn't do anything of his own will or anything of his own accord. He was in constant prayer and constantly fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And it's actually the Holy Spirit of God that manifested the miracles. This part is also theologically in interesting. Jesus, as a human being, was not omnipotent. He wasn't. He walked around. He didn't fly through the air and like, oh, you know. He could perform miracles, but only using the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's very important for the Christian. 
Because if you're a Christian, that is the only miracle working power that you have. That is also actually the only wisdom that you have. It comes straight from above. And if you're not accessing God in prayer, you are effectively useless as a Christian. The Bible says, without me, you can do nothing. That's why you see so few powerful Christians out there, because they don't pray and then talk. They, they, they act, if you're an atheist, they act mostly like you. They talk, they think, they walk, eat, sleep, mostly like you, except every once in a while they pray. That's not how the Bible is, has told us to live. We're supposed to live prayerfully first, above everything else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first. We're supposed to weave prayerfully first. Now, were somebody to actually try to live that way, imitating Paul as he imitated Christ, it would be an extraordinarily powerful, revolutionary way of living in the world. Transformational, actually. Not even sure you would even need to do all that much other than show up at the scene and be Christ-like. <laughs> whatever that entails. What does that entail? I don't know. It's whatever. Show up to see and do something, I don't know, Christ-like. You say something really profound, and everyone's like, oh, wow, he's really deep. And then you say something really, like, merciful, and everyone's like, oh, he's kind, too. So, that's... <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. You know, you got to have a sense of humor about this stuff. I think that's pretty funny. You're not, you're not following me on that? All right, never mind. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, that's all on that for now. Just think about it. Try to spell it out for you to the best of my ability. 100% God, 100% man. That is the theology. And that is some of the reasoning behind it. Showing you, be Christian Jew or miscellaneous, how to live in this body the way God would have you be living and walking out your life in this body. A Christian is supposed to be trying to find the perfect will of God. Amen.